I have been a fan of Professor for a very long time, and one of my favorite things to watch of his is We Party You, and him losing his mind in Hide and Go Beak, using the game of being rigged. But is it? I've actually wondered this for a while, and on <laughs> after searching YouTube and Google, no one's answered this question. So I figured since all my requirements for my BSC in math are now complete, and I'm bored, I'd give it a go. So in this video, we will be performing an experiment and analysis to determine once and for all whether Hide and Go Beak is rigged. And spoiler alert, the results are shocking. So without further ado, go like the video, go subscribe. Let's get into this. The hurdle I struggled with throughout was how am I going to do this? So, and in order to figure that out, I need to design an experiment that would work. So I, the initial plan was to play Highway Rollers over and over and over again until I got the game, but I quickly realized that that would take years to get done. So to save time, I came up with the following assumptions that I'll put on your screen now. Number one, there is no difference in the game's behavior between difficulties, i.e. the behavior and the probability of you winning will be the same on beginner difficulty as standard as master and the results of this video is going to be causing a follow-up where we explore that the number of human controlled players does not affect the game's behavior i.e whether only one human is human controlled versus two three or four has no effect on the game's behavior and this too is going to be followed up on assumption three each game is an independent trial. That is, the outcome of the previous game has no effect on the outcome of the next. So if you win game a uh, game one, you are equally likely to win game two. Most critically, however, we are assuming that there is no difference in the game's behavior playing through the mini game mode versus playing through a main game, i.e. the behavior the game displays through selection in highway rollers is the same as when it's selected in mini games. I need to make these assumptions so that the experiment can go forward and because time does not allow me to run a whole bunch of tests on the various difficulties, although this will happen eventually. With these assumptions in mind, I came up with my procedure that's designed to eliminate as many extraneous variables as possible. Basically, the goal was to make sure that whatever my results were, they would all be down to the game and not anything else. So step one, set the CPUs to standard difficulty and keep them the same throughout testing. Step two, play the minigame in the minigame selection. Step three, select the furthest left bush to hide behind. Shockingly, this was always the same kind of bush, so that was interesting and eliminated a variable I was very worried about. Step four, record results, including whether the leftover bush got knocked over by the ostrich. Step 5, repeat steps 3 and 4 until 100 trials have been completed. With all that out of the way, it was time to figure out which test I was going to use. Now I ended up searching through some of my old statistics textbooks to see which test made sense given what we we know about the game and what we've assumed. So and I ultimately settled on a chi-squared goodness of fit test, which is used to determine whether a categorical variable, which is what we have because you either come in first, second, third, or fourth, follows a theoretical distribution. In this case, we're, because we're dealing with four, in theory, likely, equally likely possible outcomes, you would expect that in 100 trials, we would have 25 instances trials resulting in first place for the human controlled player, 25 were also instances of second place, 25 instances of third, and 25 instances where we got last. The idea behind this is that in an infinite number of trials, if we were to continue to do this over and over and over again for the rest of time, you would expect the distribution of results to, in theory, look like, look even. This concept is called expected value in statistics, and it's going to be, this is going to be the distribution that we test against. Now, all we need are our hypotheses and significance value before we can talk about the results. Now, for the hypotheses, we actually need two. The null hypothesis, which is what we're going to try to reject, and the alternative hypothesis, which is what we're trying to prove. And in this case, the, our null hypothesis is, quote, hide and go beak follows the hypothesized distribution. And our hypo alternate hypothesis is, quote, hide and go beak doesn't follow the hypothesized distribution. The goal is to reject the null hypothesis. And to do that, we're going to need a significance value. 
Now, a significance value is, in short, the threshold beyond which we can reject the null hypothesis. It's a bit more complex than that, but it also isn't a statistics video, so I'm not going to worry about it. Just know that if the values we calculate later are less than the significance value, we will reject the null. And, otherwise, and if they are greater than or equal to our significance value, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, in this case, we're going to choose a significance value of 0.05, because it's a very standard pick in statistics, and outside of some niche situations, 0.05 is what you're going to use. Um, your stats profs and your math teachers will hopefully back me up on this. But with all that out of the way, let's get into the data. And let me tell you, what I found was shocking. This is the graph of results for each player, color-coded to their color on Wii Party U, with purple being the expected value for comparison. I've also put up a table with the raw numbers beside it so you can see them too. And the initial data in and of itself was fascinating. I had the majority of my results be in either first place or second place, while Eureka had hers in either third or fourth. Meanwhile, Dylan's results almost exactly mirror the hypothetical distribution, which just isn't something you see very often in an experiment and is really cool. As for Julia, I mean, her results aren't really anything to write home about. Nothing that, I, that shocked me. I also recorded how often the ostrich knocked over the unoccupied cover, and out of the 100 trials, 61 of them had this happen. Isn't going to play into anything, but thought it was interesting. Let's get into our set of calculations. In order to determine our chi whether our significant or p-values, which is what we're going to calculate, we need to perform four very quick calculations to get a test statistic. So we're going to use the following formula to determine that. x squared, or our test statistic, is equal to the summation, basically that's adding up all the various things, of the observed value of each category. So in this case, because I got, um, because let's say Dylan got first 25 times. You have 25 minus the expected value, which is 25 squared, divide, divided by 25. So basically you're adding up the differences between what we observed and what we expected, and then dividing it by the expected value to figure out how closely our data matches what we expect. I put an example calculations up on the screen now. So fr from there, all we need to do is determine our degrees of freedom. And in this case, that's really easy, subtracting one from the total number of categories. So four minus one equals three and plugging it all into either a p-value calculator that you can find online or Microsoft Excel, depending. I did both and ended up with the same results, so it should be fine. Doing this gives us the p gives us the following. The p-value for my human-controlled me was 0.04769. Nice. The p-value for Juliet was 0.79157. The p-value for Eureka was 0.06348. And finally, the p-value for Dylan was 0 0.9562. Not really a surprise for either Juliet or Dylan. They didn't really have anything special that would cause any eyebrows to be raised, other than Dylan getting very close to the theoretical distribution. From this, like, seriously, there was really nothing here that surprised me, except for my knees calculations. Because from this, we can compare these p-values to our significance value, and we can observe that we can reject the null hypothesis for my results. However, we fail to reject the null hypothesis for all three CPU results. What this means is that we have enough evidence to conclude that my results do not follow the hypothesized distribution, but we do not have enough evidence to conclude the same about the CPUs. Basically, it means that there is a factor at least one beyond random chance influencing the placement of the one human controlled me in hide and go beak or is there it is possible that what we are dealing with is a type 1 error basically a type 1 error means that i've got a false positive and have rejected the null hypothesis when i shouldn't have 
After all, that 0.047 means that there is a 4.7% chance that my results follow the hypothetical distribution. And while that is quite unlikely, it's still possible. Now, I could decrease the odds of a type 1 error by decreasing my significance value, but that increases the, er the possibility of a false negative, also known as a type 2 error. There are ways to mitigate type 2, I'm not going to get into them for the sake of time and because, let's be realistic, no one cares. And I did 100 trials, were probably okay for all the things that could potentially cause a type 2 error. So, or I'll get called out on game theory or something, it'll be really funny. In all seriousness, no, I would be amazed if anything type 2 error related was affecting anything or... I didn't have a strong strong enough statistical power, so let's talk about my interpretation of our results. What's interesting about this, these results, is that at least at standard difficulty, the game seems to be rigged in my favor. My theory here is that the game weights the odds depending on difficulty, and as the difficulty increases, your odds of winning decrease. But that's and that once you have been decided, the CPUs just get decided randomly. But that is going to be a video for another day. Until then, thank you all very much for watching. And if you do find this stuff interesting, subscribe. I'll definitely be doing more research into this minigame, and I'm looking forward to sharing my findings with you. Until then, though, take care. I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.